you will, join me with today as we begin our lesson in Matthew 16 and 18. And I'm going to read one scripture, and then you may be seated as we start a new lesson this, this quarter or this month, as we do every month. But Matthew 16 and 18, the Bible says, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not pay, prevail against it. Today, if you can, you can be seated today. Today, as we start a new series today, as, a, as the month begins, so the, the series we're going to talk about this, sun, this, this month is going to be the Glorious Church. And it presents the church as one of God's greatest gifts to His people. The lessons we sh will show us that God's plan for His his, his church by declaring today as we're going to talk about he would build his church then we're going to talk about the purpose of the church the church in action and then finally the fourth, fourth week we'll talk about the beautiful bride of Christ this series will get us a greater appreciation for the church and for the important role that it should play in each one of our lives the church is important to us it's not we're just talk, talking about the four walls here today, but we're talking about the church. You know, Jesus is coming, and he's coming real soon, and I believe that with my whole heart. And, you know, we've, we've talked about that. We've heard people preached about that, about how God is wrapping up things and how you can see it on just on the, in, on the daily news. You can see it in, just in the atmosphere. You can feel that there's something. People that don't know nothing about church knows that there's something. Something in the atmosphere that's fin to change. And, and I believe it's because Jesus is fin to come back. And when he returns, he is coming for a glorious church. And he is coming for a great church. Today, I'm going to start today in my, my lesson today. I'm going to share a, just a story and just kind of a, a humorous story maybe. But just, you know, as a, as a father, as when I grew up in, in church and grew up in the country and as I grew up as a when I had our, our daughter was born, and me and my wife, we both love to fish. She loves to fish more than I do. I love to catch fish, but she loves to fish. <laughs> and so, so we, when, when we cared our young daughter, when she got a little old enough to go fishing, she decided to go fishing. We went fishing, and we went down to a little small lake beside, right down the road from our house, and as we began to fish, she was probably about the age of her own daughter now. It was about a year, a little over a year old. And as we were sitting there fishing, she was we, was, we was baiting the hook and throwing the fish, throwing the hook in the water and fishing. And before long, our daughter, you know, she was curious and she wanted to hold one of the worms. And as we, so, you know, as a dad, dad just hands her the worm, the wiggler. And before we turned around in just a few seconds, it was just about this much of the wiggler. It was the only thing that was sticking out of her mouth. <laughs> she didn't have the concept of fishing. <laughs> everything at that age, you know, as a dad, he didn't think about it, but everything at that age, is, it goes in their mouth. It's food when you hand them something. But she didn't swallow it. She didn't do it. But she does, and she still, she loved the fish to the stents today. But today we're going to talk about a fisherman. That's what I'm going to start out talking. So I just shared that funny story. But today Simon... He was a fisherman. He looked the part with the tan leathered muscles, the, leather, the tan on his arms from being in the sun. He smelled the part, just ask his wife, when he come home every day. He lived the part. He lived to be a fisherman. You know, his day as he grew up in the morning, he got up as, he probably just like a lot of us other, grew up in our family business. He grew up and I believe all he knew all of his life was fishing. He knew how to fish. After the sun disappeared every day, he would meet up with his friends or his colleagues, his work partners, and they would head out to the boats to see what they would, what they would catch that, af that afternoon and that night. You know, Simon, he was a fisherman. He loved to fish. But, you know, I think Simon, you know, he had the I'd rather be fishing bumper sticker on the back of his mule. I feel like he... He loved to fish. But one day he met Jesus who called him to do something higher than just fish for fish. Jesus called Simon to fish for men. That day Simon also called Peter, 
was fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And Luke 5 presents Jesus was preaching at the very same, self, same, same sea to a great crowd. And as the story goes, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase here today in this story, but perhaps due to the large crowd, Jesus, he asked the fishermen. He said, Simon Peter, I asked the fisherman, Simon Peter, who did not appear to be part of the, the great crowd that was listening. I think he was just coming in from his night of toil in the fishing as a job. You know, I think he, you know, sometimes, you know, we love to do things, but sometimes it becomes a job when everything don't go just right. And I feel like Simon Peter, I feel like he was coming back from a hard night of fishing. And the Bible tells us, no, in just a few minutes, get ahead of myself, but in just a few minutes, he didn't catch nothing all night long. But I feel like he was probably, you know, just like us, from a hard day of work, and when everything didn't go just right, he was probably ready to go home. But Jesus asked Simon Peter, he says, he says, if he could ask him if he could borrow his boat, and as he borrowed Jesus' boat, he climbed, Jesus climbed into the fishing boat. Peter pushed the boat out to the sea, and, be, and then he became a member of Jesus' crowd. After Jesus' message, he approached Peter and instructed him to take the boat out to the deep where he would catch fish. You know, this may have been an odd way of paying rent on this boat or this slash pulpit that Jesus used. Surely Jesus had saw the obvious they had just returned from a whole night of fishing that they didn't catch nothing. But Peter agreed and took two boats out to the deep, deep water and based on Jesus' words. But I'm just like Peter. I feel like Peter, you know, if you know Peter, he was kind of a person that kind of said what he thought or felt like he thought. And I just kind of feel like I, sometimes I can feel like Peter. I feel like the flesh in Peter probably said on his way back out when they were you know, going right back out in the same waters they just came from that they had fished all night and didn't catch a fish. He probably said, what does this preacher know about fishing? You know, sometimes, you know, we look at things, you know, we look at it out of our eyes, out of what we think should happen or what, what we've experienced. You know, here we sometimes, we may feel like Peter, you know, we may not say the words, but sometimes the thoughts go through our mind. When we feel God or we, tell, or we hear a message preached for us to go back and do it one more time. When it didn't happen the last time, or didn't, things didn't go right the last time, but Jesus tells us to go back and do it again. Sometimes we may not say it, but sometimes we feel that. Am I being too, as Brother Toby said, I'm not trying to be too transparent here today, but I feel like sometimes in my life, I feel like, what is, you know, what, I feel like, what does he know about this? We fished all night and caught nothing. Now he thinks there are going to be fish out there just because he says there are going to be fish out there. But I feel like Peter didn't know who he was, at this point, didn't know who he was talking, who he was dealing with. He says, I can't wait to see the look on oh, this guy's face when we come back empty again. Because he just told us, we'll go catch fish. We'll go out there and catch fish. But Peter and James and John, they casted their nets. They heard the sounds of their nets. The Bible says in, in verse 6 of Luke 5, said their nets tearing. They were so full of fish. They say, may say, what is happening? When the boat leaned and rocked back and forth, and the number of when, when Peter saw the number of fish that he was lifted in the net, it assured him he was experiencing a supernatural event. Sometimes you know, when we go through life and we go through things in life, and when things don't feel like they're going just right for us, you know, and God says, just do it one more time. And when it, when it happens, sometimes we're, we're, we're there in, in, in unbelief, you know, in, you know, we don't believe what we can see sometimes. But when we see the supernatural, sometimes God lets us, lets us go through a, a dry season in our life. And he allows us to go through some, some rough bumps in our life. I believe to let him, let us to see that, that he is in complete control. Sometimes we, when we see the things like Peter, when Peter saw the net full of fish after he had fished all night long and didn't get fish, he realized this is not just, this just didn't happen. The fish just didn't swim into our nets this time because we threw them out. There's something different about this time. Peter did not know how the fish got there or how Jesus knew that they would be there. Peter just knew that he had experienced something that, had, that defied all of his previous experiences. 
Sometimes in life, you know, we, there's things at times in my life where God has allowed maybe not a fish to get in a net, but he's allowed things to happen in my life that, that was undeniable that God did that. It was undeniable when the doctor said it couldn't happen. God allowed it to happen. And so there's times in life, you know, we go through things in life. That is the outcome of encounters when we experience God. When we come in God's presence, things change. When God shows up, I preached a message, Brother Toby talked about one message, but I preached a message here a while back. When God shows up, things, the unordinary things change. And there's so much truth to that. So many times in life, we know we try to do it like Peter. We try to do everything on our, with our own abilities. But God has to show up sometimes and let him show him who he really is. He shows us who he really is in our life. Peter knew Jesus was more than just a man. Even the rabbis couldn't have performed such a feat. You know, Peter said, at least he has to be a prophet. <laughs> but when Peter arrived back at shore to face Jesus, he collapsed to his knees and prayed. In Luke 5 and 8, he said, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. You know, when we look at Peter's life, you know, when he confronted Jesus, when he came into the presence of Jesus, I believe what the conviction over what he had said or what he had felt or all of his sin in his life, he felt overwhelmed with that because he was in the presence of the Almighty. He realized who, who, who he really was that he was experienced with. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah had a, a similar experience. Isaiah had a vision of God positioned on the throne within the temple in Jerusalem. Angels were singing around the throne. The entire temple began to shake violently. And Isaiah cried, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. Yet I have seen the king and the Lord of heaven's army. Much like Peter, Isaiah was confronted with his sinfulness upon seeing God's manifestation in power. You know, sometimes, you know, when we come in the presence of God, sometimes when we come in the house of God, we come in this church, sometimes we feel that, that, that overwhelming, we, we are confronted with that sinful nature of our life. Sometimes, you know, is it may be just weights or it may be actual sinful things that we've done in our life. And when we come in this life with the sinful world we live in, we, sometimes we come in here, we feel that weight. We feel that weight and we feel that in our life and we feel like God is, we're overwhelmed. And sometimes we're, we're, like, we're like Peter or even Isaiah, we, we feel like we're doomed. That we can, can, God can never forgive me for what I've done. Am I, anybody ever felt that way before? They felt like, God, I'm, I've done so much and I'm overwhelmed and God just depart from me or I, I'm just doomed. Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne and Peter saw a net full of bursting with fish that only the divine intervention might explain. These divine encounters portray an important truth. When we see God, the views of ourselves, the views of others, and the view of the world are radically Altered. When we see it the way God sees it, when we see that light and darkness does not mix, when light shines on darkness, darkness has to flee. And so when we see that in life, you know, things has to be alteredly, it has to be, it has to be radically altered. It cannot be the same. Sometimes, you know, as a sinful young person or sinful, even in my own adult life, when I've walked into the presence of God in a church, that feeling I felt, that feeling I felt that I had sin in my life, that I had sin in my life that I must overcome, that I cannot feel comfortable, that uncomfortable feeling. It wasn't a condemnation against me, but it was, it was a good condemnation against that sin in my life. But rather than denying their sinfulness or attempting to solve the problem themselves, Peter and Isaiah, Peter and Isaiah owned their sinfulness. Sometimes in life, you know, we, we know we have sin in our life and we say, well, I'll fix this problem. I'll take this on myself. 
or I'll deny that I have it in my life. And that is one that we all do. We all have probably done that. I don't have, I'm all, I'm all good. Just like when someone walks up to us and asks us how you're doing. Our first response is, I'm good. No matter how bad we hurt, how bad we're sick, first expression of our face is, oh, everything's good. And sometimes we come to church with that say, we put our tie on and our jacket and our nice dress on and, and we may have things in our life that we're struggling with. But we got that I'm good outlook on our life. We're denying that we have problems. We deny we have troubles in our life. But we must be like Peter and Isaiah. We must own their, our sinfulness or own our problems. Likewise, both of, the, both of these left their encounters commissioned into God's service because they handled their sinfulness right. These men were just like men and women, just like we are today. They had flesh on them, just like we have. They had a sinful flesh. They had sin in their life, obviously. But because they were mighty used by God is because how they handled their situation. Isaiah became Jehovah's prophet to the kingdom of Judah. Peter became a fisher of men. Encountering Jesus causes a radical shift in our lives. When we encounter Jesus or we allow Jesus in our life, we see things different. We walk different. We even look different. And it's not what we wear. I've seen people when they got the Holy Ghost or when they come up out of the baptism and I've seen them cleansed. A sinful life before. They may still have look some of the same markings on their bodies or some of the same things in their life, but you can see a whole different in their countenance. I've seen many men come up and they say, I feel so clean. And that is not because they just got to come up out of the water. It's because God had cleansed them. They had changed them. When they had come into something more powerful than what they had ever been exposed to, they had been changed. When we meet Jesus, our values change as we realign our lives to match his holy purpose for our life. When we come in contact with Jesus... The things we value the most change. You know, if it's fishing or if it's hunting or sometimes sometimes in life, you know, we feel like that is the most important thing. Or maybe a job is important and all these things are important, maybe important to you. But we value, our values change when we become in, aligned in what God's purpose is for our life. Peter began fishing for fish, but he left fishing for men. Today I ask you a question. What have you left behind to follow Jesus? Here, Peter left his livelihood. Peter left something he probably loved to do. Not that, you know, we know in Scripture he did go back and fish again, but, you know, he probably fished on the side, but he, but, but he left this to do follow Jesus. And sometimes in life, you know, there's things that we will have to lay down we will have to lay down to follow Jesus. To go where God wants us to carry you, there will be things that you have to lay down. And you cannot go where he wants you to go. The word church has become connected with a gathering place for Christian services. You know, when we talk about, we say the word church, we think about this building, this beautiful building. But it has lost its original meaning, the earlier Christians attributed to it. If Jesus came to build his church and plans to have us to play a role in it, we must understand what Jesus came to build. You know, if he's come to build a church, and we've been, that's what we're talking about here today, is he's come to build a church. We must, before we leave here today, I want to try to drive home what, is, what Jesus has really come to build. It's not... Brick, it's not sheetrock, carpet. All these things will pass away. He come to build a church that will go forever. If Jesus, came, <clears throat> if Jesus came to build a physical meeting places for Christians across the world, his mission is almost complete. 
Because if you can drive from here to Lake City or you can drive anywhere you want to go in every street corner, there's a building that has a church sign in front of it. All over the world, if you'll get on the, the, the World Wide Web and their internet and there's churches in every corner of the world. In the most remote parts of the world, there's, there's church buildings. However, Jesus' mission is about building a spiritual kingdom and not, not a uh, rock and mortar building. The, the word church in our English translation of the New Testament comes from a Greek word that literally means to call out of. When you say church, the church consists of those who have been called out of this world of sin and called together into Christ's kingdom. Since we are a group of people called out of this world and called together by Christ, we must be directly connected to the person of Jesus Christ. If we're going to be called out to be his bride, we've got to be connected to him. We should see, our reflection of him should be shown through us in everything that we do. The mission of, the, the mission of Christ is, is the mission of the church. His mission, what he, what he is drive to do, should be the mission of the church. Jesus gave the clearest and most precise definition of his mission in Luke 4. In verse 18, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive and recovering the, of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus was quoting a prophecy from Isaiah and he announced the fulfillment of that prophecy. His ministry was just that. He was anointed to preach to the poor. So our, his mission is our mission. So we need to take this scripture and we need to clearly identify with that purpose of his ministry. We cannot separate the person of Christ from the work of Christ. So many people wants to do that. So many churches wants to do that. They want to separate the work of Christ. We do good for people and everything's good. But you can't take Jesus out of that. Because Jesus is the center of it all. So many people want to take him out. They have charity and give charity and all that. So everything is all good. But if you take Jesus out of that, it loses its power. It loses its responsibility. We cannot under, understand one without the other. The title Christ means the anointed one. And it represents the Hebrew word Messiah. Jesus' last name was not Christ. Rather, it was the title that recognized Jesus as anointed by the Spirit of the Lord. It was not a, it was not a name, it was not a title, but it was a title of who that he represented the Spirit of God. As Jesus' disciples, we are called to continue in Jesus' ministry and extend it to the ends of this earth. We must extend what he came to do. He came to reach the lost. And that is what the church's ministry is, is to reach the lost. In Acts 1 and 8, he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and to all Judea, and in Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. He has gave us the power to reach the lost. So many times, you know, we talk about the scripture, the uttermost parts of the earth, and we think about, you know, I don't feel like God has called me to go to Ethiopia, or I don't feel like God has called me to there. But God has called you to reach who he called you to reach, and that is the people you rub shoulders with every day. Luke provided a subtle, subtle hint to this in the first verse of the book of Acts. While speaking of his previous volumes in, in the gospel of Luke, he stated his gospel detailed in Acts 1 and 1. He says, all that Jesus began to, both to do and to teach. And that is what he's called us to do. He has called us to do and teach. Go and do in his, his will and teach. The gospel of Luke was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But it was not the end of his ministry. When you look through the book of Acts, it is the, it is the continuation of Jesus' ministry through his disciples. 
through the 12 people he called while he was here on earth. But through us, Jesus is still doing and teaching in our world today. He has went further though. He said the disciples, the book of Acts records their, their ministry. The disciples that he called on while he was here on earth, the 12. But, but here I'm here today to tell you that that, that didn't just stop when they were, they were martyred or when, when they, they, one of them took their last breath. God's, Jesus' ministry didn't end at that point. It didn't end at the end of the Bible. Because as Brother Boyd says many times, there's heroes of the faith walking and wearing clothes just like we do here today. There's heroes of faith in this building here today. Men and women that has carried the load of this, this church and carried the load of the, the church ministry for many, many years. Long after that boat rental on the Sea of Galilee, Peter recognized that Jesus for who Jesus really was. According to Matthew 6 and 16, 16 and 16, Simon Peter confessed Jesus as the Christ. He says, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here he is telling Peter recognizing who Jesus really is. While many people have recognized Jesus as an important teacher or an important leader or even a revolutionary, Jesus' messiahship is a spiritual revelation that comes only from God. You know, we, we've, I've, I grew up around church. I crawled around under these pews. It's been a while ago. But I did. I crawled around the pews under the old white building that no, a, lot of some, a lot of people don't even know nothing about. It was right beside this. But I had to give a revelation from God. Even though I, I had Sunday school teachers that taught me. Many, many times. Many lessons and youth leaders and everything else. But I had to have a personal revelation. And that sometimes that's when we see who Jesus really is, it has to come through a personal revelation of who he is individually. Yes, I can stand here today and I can show you in Scripture where Scripture says who he is and I can show you where Peter said who he is and I can say where this one showed who he was. But do you see who he really is to you today? And God will show you that revelation if you'll seek for it. As we have seen in Luke 4 and 18, it reveals the Messiah's ministry. In the book of Acts, believers continued that ministry. And we should see the, the continuation of that same ministry in our local church here today. You know, what, we, we, what we, we stand on here today is exactly the same thing the disciples preached. I say this many times when I walk into the prison, when I stand before men that I've never stood before. I said, I'm not going to preach one thing that's not in this Bible. I'm not gonna, everything that I tell you is, is, is not going to be a apostolic or it's not going to be Pentecostal or this or that from our doctrine or from our organization. It's going to be from the Word of God. The same message I preach is the same message that Peter and John preached. And so today, you know, that, that same ministry goes forth. And that's how this should go forth from this church. When we understand who Jesus is and what his mission is, we go and we do likewise. We are his church. And his church is not this beautiful building we're standing in today. The earliest gathering places for worship in the Bible was in believers' homes. There were places outdoors. They were in all kind of orthodox places. It wasn't in a nice air-conditioned padded pew building. Even some of our ancestors that, that taught me Sunday school lessons didn't have the, the luxuries we have here today. But I'm here today to tell you, it's not the building. It is we are the church. When we understand the humble beginnings of the Christian faith and the view Christians had of themselves as a group of what they really believed they were, it's hard to see how churches have become multi-million dollar buildings. When you look at the humble beginnings of the church in the book of Acts, 
the church. They considered themselves the church, the body of Christ. And how is that humble beginning became multi-million dollar buildings today? While these buildings, and I'm not, not, not knocking nice buildings. I love this air conditioning. I love the padded pews. But I'm here today to tell you, sometimes we've got, the, the, got, the, got out of perspective of what we're talking about. While these buildings can be tremendous assets, we live in a world where instead of being the church, believers attend church. The church has become a place that we go, and church is a, something that we, we go and do, things that we do. Instead of being the church, sometimes I go to church. I have men on my, people on my job that says, where do you go to church? And, it's, it's some, and, it's, and so we really what we should say is, I go, we worship at this place. But I am the church. The church has become a place we go and do. There is little emphasis on the public conscious of being the church. Instead of sharing our personal testimonies of the gospel, many have settled for inviting people to church. Instead of being that testimony on a job, I'm guilty. Hey, you come be in church with us. Instead of opening my Bible and sharing it right there. You know, every one of us here today knows what, what you got to do to be saved. I've been guilty of trying to get my coworkers to come to church and get saved. Come to church and we'll teach you a Bible study. And I know that's all important. I mean, I'm not here. Me and my wife is over outreach, so I'm not trying to, <laughs> about that. But we should be the church everywhere we go. Amen. Not just while we're in this building on Sundays and Wednesdays. We should invite people to visit a place where the church gathers. But as believers, bring church to people everywhere we go. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, we need to get, ask people to come with us and gather here with us. Yes, they can get saved here. But we must be the church every day. We can't be the one thing here and be something different there. So we must be the church every day. We must reflect on what kind of church we should, we must, in everyday life, we must, we must reflect on what kind of church we are bringing to our coworkers, to our family members, to our friends. Every day when we get up and we leave to go to work, we should think about, what am I reflecting? What kind of church am I showing them? Yeah, I attend Hatchpin Apostolic Church, but when I walk on the job, am I reflecting that? Brother Boyd has said so many times throughout the years, many years, he said at the end of services, he said, now go be the church. Yeah. And that's not just a statement to close out the service. That's what we should do every day. We should go be the church. Can, can God move at your workplace? Can he move at the hardware store? Can he move at your house? Or is he just limited to this building where we meet at? Perhaps the most dangerous thing about a church building is that it has caused us to relegate faith to a place rather than to people. Sometimes, you know, we say, come to our church and we'll pray for you. God will heal you. And I'm not neglecting bringing people to church. Hear what I'm saying today. I'm saying, you know, if somebody has got a need in his life, the Bible says the elders lay hands on them, pray for them, and they will sick will recover. They don't have to come on Sunday at 10 o'clock to get prayer. They don't have to come on just on Wednesday nights to get prayer. We can pray on for them anytime. The church is a people, not a building. We must retain our corporate identity as the body of Christ and be the church God is calling us to become. Disciples have committed to follow the teaching and examples of each other. The relationship between a Today, as I 
begin to, begin to close. It's going to be a little longer runway, but not be too long, I don't know, but I begin to start closing anyway. The relationship between a martial arts student and his teacher pro- provides a contemporary example of the relationship between a disciple and his master. And I don't be, try to be too, too, too vague on this here, but I just want to feel like a student just learns, if, if a student just learns knowledge and skills from his sensei or his master, it, but not how to apply them to real life, they are, that person is left immature and defenseless. Jesus offers us a similar relationship and it distinctively sets us apart as Christians. But today if we come here and we learn this word of God and we put it in our hearts and that's all great and good and all good. But if we don't learn how to apply it to life, we will find ourselves immature in that. If we just come to church and sit on a pew and listen to them sing and listen to a great message every week and don't allow that to apply to change our life, we will leave here immature Christians. We will leave here defenseless against the enemy that's going to fight us when we walk out these doors. So we must apply that, learn how to apply this word of God. We need to learn how to apply what we hear across this pulpit to in our life. Jesus' love makes this relationship unique. It goes a little bit further. He loves us. His love is not based on our worthiness, worthiness or our ability to return that love. He don't love us just because we're worthy. He don't love us because we can return, even be able to, the ability to return that level of love. Because we don't have that ability. He loves us so much. Someone that loved us so much to go to a, a cross for our, li- our, our life when we were unlovable. When we love, then when we love others as Jesus has loved us, God abide, abides with us and is perfect, perfected within us. John 21, we see another situation similar to Luke 5. Peter and James and John and other disciples were near the Sea of Galilee after Jesus had risen from the dead. Peter decided to go fishing, and the other disciples decided to go with him. They fished all night, but caught nothing. Here Peter is fishing again and fishing all night without catching anything. And a a man appeared and instructed them to just cast their nets on the other side of the boat, and they would catch fish. When they obeyed, they caught a tremendous number of fish. Suddenly, the Bible says the disciples recognized that the man on the shore was Jesus. Peter, Peter quickly jumped into the sea and swam toward Jesus. Jesus spoke to Peter when he got to shore and he asked him three times, do you love me? He says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus came specially for Peter to restore him to his position as a disciple. Because if you know, if you're familiar with the story of Peter, Peter had just denied Christ three times. And I feel like that Jesus asked him if he loved him three times for each time that he denied him. Jesus' focus was not on Peter's knowledge or Peter's ability, but on restoring the relationship from which Peter's future ministry would flow. Jesus knew exactly where Peter was and responded to Peter in a way that would speak to Peter's heart. Jesus finished his talk with Peter by saying, follow me. Then Jesus prophesied to Peter about his death as a martyr when Peter was very old. Peter may have lost his faith when he was young, but Peter wouldn't lose his faith when he was old. He clung to that faith because Jesus made a way to him and restored him. Jesus calls us to a focus on our own individual calling and our individual ministry. Our human nature has a, a habit of hiding and blaming others when God comes seeking for us. Genesis 3, 
Our God has an intentional plan to develop a relationship with us that helps us grow and discover our calling. And so sometimes in life, you know, we need to realize today is we're called to be the church. God has made many ways. He's went out of his way. I'm talking about myself today. He's went out of his way to, to restore that many times when I had broken that. When I denied who he was. Jesus has made a way. And Jesus has an individual. He knows how to, how to deal with each with us individually. He knows what it takes for each one of us to restore that in our life. To facilitate the process, we must allow the Spirit to guide us closer to Him instead of moving away from Him. You know, some, so it's so easy in life for us to just to want to drift away from Him. Allow things like Brother Toby talked about, weights in our life to come upon us. But I'm here today to tell you we need to draw closer to God. He has, he's called us on a mission. And he has called us as a church to reach the lost. And so today as we, as we stand across here today, I ask us today to draw closer to God. And don't allow this world to allow us to drift away from him. Because God has got a calling and God is on, Jesus is coming back for his church. He is just before wrapping this thing up. And I feel like God is wanting, to make a, wanting us to be the church and calling us to build a church. And Jesus wants to build a church here in this community. He wants to build a church in this, in this world. And today, by building that church, we must draw closer to him. So today, let us pray today. Lord Jesus, I ask you to touch us and anoint us today. I ask you to minister right now, Lord Jesus, to us today, Lord Jesus, and draw us closer to you, Lord. Allow you to build, Lord Jesus, what you need to build in our lives today, Lord Jesus. I ask you to minister to everyone under the sound of my voice here today. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch us and anoint us today, Lord, remain a part of this service today. I ask you to touch each singer, each musician today. Minister, the Lord, through us today, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. You may be...